Hi. Thanks for, thanks for having me up. Uh, I'm Susan Strait, as you said. Um, I'm a writer. I've published eight novels, two books for children. I'm Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing at University of California, Riverside. But I wanted to talk to you about some of the th same things that our first speaker did. Um, I'm a native of Riverside. I live three blocks from the hospital where I was born. But I travel all over the country, actually all over the world, talking about California and story and education. I'm actually also a classic product of the Golden State of Public Education. My mom was an immigrant from Switzerland. She's four foot eleven, really scary. She struggled for her education in Canada before she got here. Neither of my parents was able to graduate from high school. My mom taught me to read when I was three because she thought to get into American kindergarten you had to already know how. I was the oldest of five, one year separated all five of us, so my mom really wanted me to go to school. She really wanted us to be out of the house. I was chosen for gifted education in the first grade, and in my neighborhood, that was a big deal. I had to be bused to another school. When I was 13 on a school field trip to the Huntington Library in Pasadena, I fell in love with art and landscape, to add to the story. And I don't know if people know this, but when you look at, at artworks like the one above you, People came to California a lot of times because of the art that was sent out of California back in the day, like when this courtroom, I mean, uh, when this uh, Capitol building was built. Postcards were sent to New Jersey and Illinois and Massachusetts, and people saw the beauty of California and they moved here. And I think that's really what we're talking about is keeping people here. When I was 16, though, a lot of my friends already uh, began to fall into the drug world. And my mom, that scary short person, she forced me to take a writing class at Riverside City College so that I wouldn't get in trouble. I wrote my first short story. It was about an 85-year-old woman on a bus where an older man was getting high from magic markers. My professor told me that it was a great story. I got a full scholarship to USC. I ended up being the first person in my whole neighborhood to attend college. So this is what I do. I tell stories. And the reason I think I'm here today is because that has to continue. Um, my students at UC Riverside, where I've taught for 26 years, are often, like many of us in this room, first generation, um, children of immigrants who worked as janitors, as gardeners, as nurses, as teachers, as social workers, to send their kids to the UC. And part of, I think, what's really driving all of our conversation, as Mr. Calderon said, is that the young people are missing out on the same arts education that we were lucky enough to have. We really did have a golden education. My students are everyone, and so this is something I thought we'd find interesting. I just taught a class of 300 students. It was a course I wrote called The Mixed Race Novel on the American Experience. So many kids are of mixed race, um, and no one ever talks about that, and so we read four novels about people of mixed race. But here's what I did the first day. I asked how many were pre-law, how many were pre-med, how many were business majors, science majors, education, social work, and creative writing. And they all you know, raised their hands. And so, of course, I picked on the poor pre-med guys, and I was like, oh, you're just here because you think this is easy, right? <laughs> and then I asked them to think about how every single one of them has to be able to tell a story, to tell a narrative story. If you're a doctor and you can't tell your patient the story of how he or she is going to survive cancer and how the family is going to be involved, and you also can't listen to that story, you'll be less effective. The lawyers, they were really easy. I was like, if you can't tell a good story, like how your client didn't do it or how the accused person did do it, yeah, you're going to last about a week. And you have to be able to command an audience to tell a story. And that, in, that really, it, it's everything that we talked about. It's music, it's art, it's movies. Social workers have to listen to stories of need, and teachers, if they can't engage, they're not effective. So what happens is some of them come over to the dark side, what I call, of creative writing, and then they want to be poets, and then their moms get really mad at me, um, especially because they wanted their kids to be doctors. But I don't like to hear that, because I think you can be a doctor and a poet. The creative arts are important to make us all human, as in the humanities, but they're also integral to survival and success in all fields, as we've already heard testimony about. So my former students, 25 years, if you average about 500 students a year, I thought about them before I came up here. They work in advertising, a lot of them, um, and that's all about story. I mean, think about that Super Bowl commercial, the Budweiser commercial, the Clydesdale and the puppy. That was a great story. Had no words. Uh, they make video ads for international companies. One of my students uh, 
writes for gaming sites, people do voiceovers for anime. A lot of them develop and run websites, publishing platforms. They do print magazines. Many of them teach, and I think that's what's important. I had one student who came up to me after the big class, and she works in the dining hall. And I went to a basketball game, and she came up, and she said, Professor Strait, I just had the big class. And she said, I'm a freshman. I'm from Salinas, California. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And she said, but I see how much you enjoy telling stories. And she said, I saw how people in the class told stories about being foster kids or being of mixed race. And she said, I now I want to be a writer, but I'd also like to be an educator. A lot of my students go on to education at the elementary or high school levels. One thing I also do is write for KCT. Um, that's the public television station in Southern California. And uh, those are stories that are really, for me, about people who are usually overlooked, people who no one ever reads about. And I just thought I would tell you one. My daughter was playing on the tennis team at Riverside Poly High, and her partner was Emily Espinosa. And Emily's mom, Letty, came up to me one day and said, you know what? Somebody told me to go back to Mexico today. And I said, I've never been to Mexico. I'm fifth generation Santa Ana. Where are you from? And she said, that woman was from Wisconsin. I couldn't believe she said that to me. So I kept thinking about this for about six months. And I remember there's a cemetery not far from my house. And I went and did a story for KCT on that cemetery. It's called Aguamansa. And actually, the people's last name is Trujillo. They were Apache Indians who were adopted by New Mexican Hispano settlers and who then were brought to California to guard horses for the rancho owners. So they've been here since 1870, and their last name is Trujillo. Those kind of stories, people come up to me all over the country and say, you have to keep telling those stories. Those are the stories, I think, that I learned to tell because of arts education. So I guess I wanted to conclude by saying um, a special shout out to the California Arts Council, because I would have never published my first novel. After I got back from graduate school, I went straight back home. Most of my friends were doing pretty bad things. Um, they had a lot of money. And I didn't, but I didn't want to make money in the same way they did. I wanted to be a teacher. But publishing that first novel was hard, and I got a $3,000 grant from the California Arts Council. <laughs> I had a baby at the time. She was six months old, and I have this picture of her sitting in a carrier, and she's holding the check. She, <laughs> she drooled on it a lot. But that $3,000 check actually allowed me to buy a car. I didn't even have a car at that time. I wrote my first novel in my car, and now my 10th book is coming out, and I also wrote that in the car just because I got used to it and I had all those kids. It's really quiet in the car, especially if you say you're going to the grocery store and you park in the Ralph's parking lot and then no one wants to come. So that's where I work. I work in my car. And I guess I do that sort of to honor the legacy of being who I was. But that grant really put me on the road. And I would hate to see all arts funding continue, as you have pointed out, Senator Liu, at these low levels. The last thing is is that story and art, photography, all of it really drives the world. All three of my daughters work at museums. And I think I'm probably the only person in America that has three daughters who look like Beyonce who all work at museums. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in the entire world who has that. Um, we didn't have air conditioning when they were little, and they loved museums because they had air conditioning, but they also loved museum food. Just shout out to the audience behind me. Museum food is the best food in the world. It really is. And going to museums changed them. Everything is arts funding. It's funding for museums. It's funding for elementary school programs. It's funding for field trips. We used to go to museums. We went to the Huntington. We need to still have guest speakers come to high school, like me. I go all over the country. I go to high schools in New Orleans, in Minneapolis, in Salinas. The best talk I ever gave was in Greenfield. It was the spring before last. Greenfield in California, the lettuce capital of the world. I spoke to migrant farm workers' families about my novel High Wire Moon, which was about a woman who crosses the border from Oaxaca and marries an American guy and has a kid. And when I was done with that talk, the women were crying. And their kids came up to me and said, my mom says no one ever, ever, ever tells the story of a woman like her. And now I want to be a writer. Thanks very much. Thank you, Susan.